Now we'll examine the celestial sphere using a simulator. This is Sky Safari, which is a good simulator, but it's not free. We can use it to view the whole sky, and we can orbit the Earth, as well as a lot of other places, too. First, let's note the latitude and longitude lines on Earth, with the red longitude line you see there being the prime meridian. The prime meridian is the zero point for longitude, and the equator is, of course, the zero point for latitude. We don't have a lot of these lines on the Earth as they're seen here since they're spaced far apart, but that's okay for our purposes. Most important is the idea that latitude and longitude are fixed with respect to the Earth's surface and act as a coordinate system to help us locate things. If you look at the background grid that seems to be in front of the stars, that is an apparent reflection of the Earth's longitude and latitude out into space. That's the basic idea behind the equatorial coordinate system and its coordinates of right ascension and declination that is imposed upon the celestial sphere. It's a fixed coordinate system with respect to the stars, just in the same way that longitude and latitude are fixed coordinate systems with respect to the Earth. We can see the coordinates around the edge of the screen. The easiest to understand is declination. It's merely a reflection of latitude out into space. We see that there is a celestial equator, which is the projection of the Earth's equator into space and serves as the zero point for declination. Objects can range from zero declination up to plus 90 declination in the northern sky and minus 90 degrees declination in the southern sky. Right ascension, on the other hand, is the astronomical equivalent of longitude. Right ascension is the angular distance of an object measured eastward from the first point of Aries, also called the vernal equinox. Unlike longitude, right ascension is usually measured in hours, minutes, and seconds, with 24 hours being a full circle, this means that each hour is about 15, well, is not about, is exactly 15 degrees. Because right ascensions are measured in hours of the rotation of the Earth, they can be used to time the positions of objects in the sky. For example, if a star with a right ascension of 1 hour and 30 minutes and 0 seconds is at the meridian, then a star at, with right ascension of 20 hours and no, no minutes and no seconds will be at the meridian, the same meridian, uh, which is the apparent highest point in the sky due south, at 18.5 sidereal hours later. A sidereal hour is about 10 seconds shorter than your standard solar hour. Your everyday solar clock defines the 24 hours as the time for the sun to return to its original place in the sky, such as noon to noon. The sidereal day defines how long it takes for the stars to return to their original places in the sky. That's about four minutes shorter than the solar day, due to the Earth's revolution around the Sun. Let's go back to the prime meridian, which is the red longitude line. Its analogy in the equatorial coordinate system is where the ecliptic meets the celestial equator, which you can see here now. As you can see from the coordinates around the screen, that's zero hours right ascension. The ecliptic, of course, meets the celestial equator twice, and this point that we're looking at now is the ascending node, meaning it's the point that the Sun travels on as it goes on the ecliptic from below the celestial equator to above it. Nicely, as you can see from the simulation the date I chose, the planet Neptune is conveniently sitting right at that location. And what exactly is the ecliptic? The ecliptic is the path that the Sun appears to take around the sky as seen from Earth. But really, it's the path that the Earth is taking around the Sun. It's just that we're on the Earth, so we think we perceive the Sun as moving around the sky on the celestial sphere on the ecliptic. Also, all the planets in the sky are also stay pretty close to the ecliptic. In fact, most are very close to the ecliptic, except the Moon. The Moon deviates quite a bit. The reason they all stay very close to the ecliptic is because all of the planets orbit the Sun in the same plane. Yeah, it's a little bit of uh, deviation, just a bit, but not by much. But roughly all the planets go in the same plane. Once you get to planets beyond Neptune, such as the dwarf planet regime, of which Pluto's the largest, things can get really kooky and they're very much non-coplanar. Now let's take a look at an example star and look at its coordinates in this system. When I click on it, I see its name is Markab. If I click on it again, Sky Safari presents all kinds of interesting factoids. If we click then on the data tab, we can see its equatorial coordinates. We see that Markab's right ascension is 23 hours, 5 minutes, and 59 seconds, so basically 23 hours and 6 minutes. 
its declination is plus 15 degrees and 20 arc minutes. That lines up nicely with what we see in the grid. By eyeball in the grid, it's about halfway between 22 and 0 hours, and it's also just above the celestial equator. Now let's look around the sky to find the location where all the right ascension lines converge. That point is called the North Celestial Pole. We've talked about this in a previous video, but it's worth noting that in that video, we were looking at the horizontal coordinate system of altitude and azimuth, and we used the North Celestial Pole to show us our latitude. That's still of course true, but we'll now use the nearly fixed point of Polaris in the sky to give us a hand. The convergent point of all the right ascension lines is called the North Celestial Pole and is labeled NCP. I want to point out here that the Earth is rotating on its axis and in our daily lives we don't feel that spin. Let's take a quick moment to ask why that is. We don't feel it because the rotation speed is almost exactly constant. If there were any change at all, you would most certainly feel it. If the Earth magically disappeared and its gravity was no longer present in an instant, you would not be flung outwards you would fly in the exact direction that your motion of your little patch of the surface of the Earth was pointed at the moment of disappearance. Think of a shock putter or discus thrower or hammer thrower from track and field. The thrown object leaves exactly in the direction it was movement moving at the moment of release. Here, what's keeping the discus going in a circle is the arm of the athlete. For the Earth, it's the gravity of all the Earth that holds everything in a circle. To learn more about this, see my video on Newton's Laws of Motion. The important result here is that we're in a rotating reference frame and the sky is fixed, so we see the sky moving from our perspective. Therefore, the equatorial coordinate system is the most natural sky coordinate system for Earth-bound observers. It has two zero points that are tied to the Earth, the North Celestial Pole and the Equator. As a final thing with Sky Safari before going on, Let's recall my previous video on constellations. If you haven't seen that yet, take a moment to go watch that and then come back. I'll now bring them up in this simulation. Let's show the constellations and their names. We can see how they're divided up into these regions around the celestial sphere. They're divided up into regions of right ascension and declination by the light blue lines. Here I have the official boundaries along with the names and the familiar asterisms for each constellation. Notice how the blue lines are configured. They either always go around the North Celestial Pole, running along declination lines. This is easy to see with the constellations close to the NCP. And the other lines go parallel to the right ascension lines. That's funny to think about spherical trigonometry in this case, because all the angles of intersection are 90 degrees. There are no constellation boundaries that cut diagonally across right ascension and declination. In this way, the entire sky is mapped out into 88 regions, and none of them are the same shape or size. Now let's look at Stellarium, which is another sky simulation software. Let's see what we saw in Sky Safari, but from an Earth-bound perspective. First, there's the grid for the equatorial coordinate system with the zero point of the North Celestial Pole by Alpha Ursa Minoris, which is Polaris, the pole star. Just to confirm that, let's click on it and see there's the information. There it is. That's nice, Polaris. That's its name. Now let's bring up the familiar constellation lines, which are the familiar asterisms. Next, their names, and finally, the boundaries. Here, the boundaries are in red, which is flipped from what we saw in Sky Safari. Again, the boundaries run parallel to either declination lines or the right ascension lines. The boundaries for the 88 constellations completely cover the sky. So this is a bit visually busy, and I'm going to turn it all off for the next stuff. Let's explore what the celestial sphere looks like from various locations on Earth, and we'll orient ourselves in different directions. We start at New York City, which is approximately 40 degrees north latitude. Since the pole star is in the sky, we are facing north. You can see things seem to be rotating around the sky. That's because I've set up the time to run rather quickly and to keep the stars in the sky and not deal with the sunrise or sunset, so I've turned off the sun. The grid appears to be rotating. This makes sense because the Earth is rotating and we are on the Earth. From our perspective, where we're observing from a rotating reference frame, of course, things that are not in our frame that are fixed will appear to move. If we look east, we see that the ascending part of the celestial equator is always rising from due east. Higher declination values are to the north and negative declination values are to the south.
Looking south, we see that the stars appear to be circling a point in the sky that is below the horizon. That is, of course, the South Celestial Pole. We also note that the stars move from east to west along the sky. Finally, looking west, we see the celestial equator intersecting due west at an angle. That angle is also helpful in determining your latitude. The setting angle ranges from 90 degrees at the equator to 0 degrees at the poles. The setting or rising angle is 90 degrees minus your latitude. The altitude of Polaris is more direct. But if you can't see the North Star, then you can watch bright stars near the horizon to get your latitude as well. As we'll see, this works from all other locations on the Earth. Let's bring up the location window to see what the celestial sphere looks like from other locations. Let's change the latitude to the North Pole. At the North Pole, the celestial equator is on the horizon. Therefore, everything appears to circle the horizon. Right now, it's at this time that I'm recording this, which is approximately January of 2024, the sun is below the horizon. The sun never rises at the North Pole in winter. You'll also notice the cardinal directions have disappeared. At the North Pole, all directions are south. East, west, south, north, they're not really defined at all at the North Pole. But if we go one degree down from the, from the north, then we do get a north and we do get an east and a south. The stars won't rise much, no more than one degree, so it's kind of the same as being right at the North Pole. Let's now go down to the equator, which is zero degrees latitude. We're looking east. The celestial equator comes straight up to, from the horizon at a 90 degree angle. Zero latitude means a 90 degree rise angle. Let's now look south. The south celestial pole is on the horizon. Looking west, everything sets straight down to the horizon, just like looking east. Looking north, we see the north celestial pole on the horizon. So now let's go to a southern location. Say 40 degrees south latitude. Now the north celestial pole, Polaris, is below the horizon. Stars still rise in the east and set in the west, but because of our location, stars move differently than those in the northern hemisphere. To show this, let's look due east. Stars are still rising in the east, but they're rising at an angle that makes them go up and to the left as opposed to up and to the right. That's because the south celestial pole is in the sky. Looking there, there's no obvious star right next to the south celestial pole. Bringing back the constellation lines and names for a moment, we can see that the Southern Cross is in the sky. The constellation named Crux is also called the Southern Cross. It has two stars that if you make a line between them, point to the South Celestial Pole. The Southern Cross provides a helpful way of finding your way around the sky in the Southern Hemisphere. So now let's explore the South Pole and see what that looks like. So we enter South 90 degrees. At the South Pole, the Celestial Equator is again along the horizon, and again the South Celestial Pole is at the zenith just like the situation at the North Pole. Moving one degree off the South Pole, we get our North, South, and East, and West again. So now let's return home. The celestial sphere is a coordinate system that is fixed with respect to the stars. Its reference points are due to special points on the rotating Earth. The North Celestial Pole and South Celestial Pole are directly overhead the Earth's poles and the celestial equator is the extension of the Earth's equator out into space.